Hi everyone and welcome back to the Club Iron Podcast. This is episode 20 and today we are joined by a very special guest, our first ever strongman. Now that is Mr Matt Diamond. Matt, say hello to everyone. Hi, hi everyone. Thank um, you. Now for those of you who don't know, um, Matt is a very competitive strongman and um, sort of a competitive powerlifter as well. Um, he's he's placed in the UK strongman competitions and obviously as you can see on the camera he's won uh, the ultimate strongman yeah. for Wales this, uh, this trophy here, this big behemoth of a trophy <laughs> so why don't we start by addressing the elephant in the room that that trophy yeah. um, obviously won that in 2021 yes, um, yeah, that's, yeah, for yeah. Wales Strongest Man how was that experience then? Uh, pretty good to be honest um, bit of a mix up with the shows that we were meant to be in the Scarlet Stadium all right. So last minute we changed over to uh, Neath. Mm. But yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, I said, first time so after lockdown, we had big crowds. I think we had like 2,000 spectators. Mm. And, but yeah, it was really good. Um, like I said, it's the level of competition in Wales now has gone through the roof. Mm. So it's not as simple as, like you said, you used to have like two or three turn up. They just wash the floor with everybody now. Yeah. Um, but no, really good day. Uh, like I said, it's only my, uh, I think it's my third third year properly compete then mm. so like my goal was to win Wales the strongest man as like a peak of my my career now so obviously I've gone a lot higher than that so yeah yeah absolutely amazing show it was yeah because a competitive strongman is something that I think a lot of people are fascinated with simply for the fact of you're seeing some strong people you know yeah. it's like you Alex you said your mother watched um strongest man and she's a fan of matt <laughs> yeah yeah we were watching uk strongest man and i saw you competing i didn't i you know i just saw i was from Chilesley. i didn't uh mm. didn't remember and then obviously i remembered seeing you in dw back in the day yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that was interesting yeah, yeah. strong man so fascinating i think especially to me because it's just there's such a feat of strength and we spoke off, off air about this but there's so many different aspects of strength yeah, and like things yeah. we don't even think about like you're literally lifting like you said you had a three i think it was 340 deadlift uh 370 at the moment uh, yeah, three, yeah. 370 deadlift and i was just stood there thinking what yeah <laughs> um yeah go on sorry uh, so yeah like i said this in strongman terms it's actually quite a bad deadlift <laughs> this, uh, that's ridiculous most like top level so if you want to get into like the giants live scene you need to be in the 400 plus yeah um I'm just lucky, yes, I tend to sort of place mid-pack on the deadlift and I sort of excel in things like overhead press is my best event. Yeah, so, so. obviously obviously, there's a lot of different aspects to, to strongman competition. Um, I, I've watched a few strongman competitions, but there might be people who aren't familiar with how, they're, how they run. So why don't you explain how, what the different sort of compet- uh, competition places are? How does it work? What events do you do? So basically each competition, normally the layout is pretty much similar to most. There's five events. Um, there's generally uh, a variation of deadlift. Uh, you'll have an overhead event, normally two different types of moving events. You'll have a medley, which could be moving three or four different sandbags, tires, engine parts. Engine parts. Yeah, they started bringing in like unique objects now that aren't so simple to pick up. Like what? Um, I think Worlds had, I think they had lorry parts. So they had like suspension from lorries, things like that. Mm. Um, tires, big ones. So yeah. Carrying tractor tires. Um, tend to have something like a yoke or a farmer's, which is just pick it up, move it as fast as you can physically can. Yeah. And then nine times out of ten, you finish with Atlas Stones, which I said is it's the one event after you've done four, it's the last thing you want to be doing. So it's the heaviest event of the lot. Yeah. Uh, and it's done for time as well. So you've got to be able to move fast. So it's not just a case of picking up stupidly every week. So you've got to be able to move with it as well. Yeah. So what's a comp day like then for you? So say now if you were competing tomorrow, what would your what would it be for you? Uh, so tonight would be well, pretty much three or, three or four stakes. Um, I tend to have, like I said, whatever sauce I fancy and some chips. Uh, tomorrow morning then, basically I'll try and sleep, not always. Mm. First thing in the morning, it's always massive fry, basically, as much as I can physically fit in. Um, Doesn't sound so bad, this. No, <laughs> I, it's not too bad, I'm not going to complain. Um, comp day then, I say, right at the show, I don't tend to eat during the competition. Um, just makes me feel sick so I pick at sweets and Lucas Aid drinks things like that just for sugar for energy yeah really. so it's literally in between every event I'll have a handful of sweets and a whole bottle of Lucas Aid and that tends to tie me over until the end of the show then yeah but it's literally most shows kick off about 11 o'clock so you're arriving from about 9 mm. half past 9 you've got your athlete briefing which obviously goes through each individual individual event goes through different rules so depending on the show you're doing like I said 
you might have, say, farmers. Uh, some shows, you've just got to run 20 metres, put them down, you're done. Other yeah. ones might be, you've got to go as far as you can, but you can't put them down. Things like that. So they'll go through all the rules, and then you just basically start warming up. And normally, if they run really well, it's literally you warm up for the one event, you do the event, you're straight back, warming up for the next event, and nine, nine times out of ten, your call's pretty much straight out. Oh, that's, so it's... That's like, crazy. Yeah. I mean, how, how can you stay energised? Because it's not, you know, you're big guys... So surely your cardio is going to drop off um, at some point and you're just going to be, like, fatigued and exhausted. Yeah, it's not too bad because everyone thinks, obviously, it's a long day. But if you think about it, you're actually only lifting, on average, for five minutes through the whole day because each event normally is 60 seconds. Mm. So it's more to do with trying to control the adrenaline because, um, like, with Glenn Ross's shows now, who's the main guy I compete for, I think the lowest crowd we've had is 2,000. Mm. Um, like, UK's is... a lot of people. Yeah, we had like six, 7,000 at UK's. He's going for 10,000 next year. So it's the adrenaline that's the hardest part. So like I said, uh, with the Welsh this year, the women competed with us, so they mm. went first. Now, for me, that was bad. My adrenaline starts kicking in from 9 o'clock in the morning, but I didn't lift until 1. So by the time I got to 1, I was drained. I had no energy. Yeah, yeah, just like, I just want to yeah. perform. So for me, ideally, I want to get there go out do your introductions that's when my adrenaline will kick in because you're in front of you know god knows how many people mm. and then i want to lift if i've then got to try and calm down at the back it's it's not the best for me but i tend to find controlling your adrenaline is the hardest part yeah because obviously you you know what you're going to do obviously because to us it seems very like you're literally lifting an absurd amount of weight but yeah. obviously you're used you know you're used to it you, you do this practically all the time so it's like how do you mentally prepare them for that like because you, you know that there's a, there's a there's a lot of risk involved with these weights oh yeah uh so basically it's it's all done in the gym so basically whatever event i got in comp i've done it hundreds of times already in the gym and it's literally the weight it is heavy but once i said every lift you'll have you'll have like a milestone like we were talking earlier on do the deadlift it took me three years to hit 300. Mm. I could pull 295 for five reps, couldn't pull 300. Mm. Um, it was only because I misloaded the bar, I pulled my first 300. As soon as I'd done that, my weight started flying up again. Yeah. Um, and you get it with every lift. You tend to plateau. Um, and I said, you get that one number, you just physically, in your mentally, you can't pick it up. Yeah. And then once you break that, you keep going. So our bodies tend to be prepped, ready for the show. The thing I said with the shows, the reason you tend to be more fatigued after, I said, that adrenaline, mm. they reckon, like I said, they've done research into they reckon you can lift anywhere from sort of 10, 15, even 20% more than you've ever lifted in the gym in a competition. Mm. So I say most people, when they do the one rep maxes in the gym, say they can pull 200 in the gym. If they go and actually do a show with a proper crowd, they might find they'll pull 220, even 240, but they'd never get any close to that in the gym. So it's a case of, prepping your body physically as much as possible and then like I said obviously the biggest thing most people don't realise is a rest week I take a whole week off no training whatsoever so that my CNS is completely recovered by the time yeah. I get to the show yeah that happens in a lot of sports doesn't it Alex you take sort of time off because I'm not I'm not too familiar with like how the weightlifting scene works in terms of like you know being like peaked yeah we've spoken yeah. this in previous you wouldn't podcasts. take a lot of time off in powerlifting but you definitely deload to at least 60 percent of your yeah. max you wouldn't start you know that's the whole point it's about bringing your fitness up right and your fatigue down yeah. so that you've got the, the fitness yeah. and the you know the, the condition and everything and the strength primarily but not the fatigue that comes with in the, in yes, the, in the yeah. last parts you know i think with the rest periods it all depends on who the coach is basically so mm. with all my clients depending on the show if it's powerlifting, they tend to do... So if they're lifting on the Sunday, on the Monday and Tuesday before, they'll do 60%, literally one rep on each lift and get out. Mm. Strongman, I might actually take 10 days, um, especially if it's got like a one rep max in there. Yeah. Uh, so you've got one rep max log or deadlift. 10 days out, that'll be my 80% day. So I'll do 80% of the competition weights, not my one rep maxes. Yeah. And then I'll just coast along for 10 days I might go do a little bit of active recovery you know, walking swimming but other than that mm. complete rest then so I want to be 100% because I say in training 9 times out of 10 you, you're training at 70 to 80% because you're still fatigued from the last training session mm. so you never actually know what you can pull until comp day Turns out you end up pulling trucks yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's insane scene. do you know you like the thought of pulling a truck because obviously, you know, you're not pulling a truck when it's moving, but you, you yeah. pull it with a rope, don't you? Yes. How yeah. on earth do you do that? Um, 
depending on which way you're doing it. So my favourite truck pull is the rope and harness. Um, again, it's literally as soon as it starts going, it's that's the hardest part. Get it moving, which again, most people think is your arms, your legs, it's more hip drive. You get your hips going. Once it's going, it's just a case of taking baby steps, breathing, and just don't stop. If you stop, trying to get that going again. so hard. I mean, how on earth uh, is is a human being? Yeah. (laughs) They do it with planes as well. I've seen it done with planes. Yeah. How? um, How? (laughs) Yeah, they've just done a plane pull, I think it was this year, for charity. Um, I think right now my heaviest truck pull was 47 tonnes. Um, right, well, hold on, hold the phone there. Yeah. I, don't, I think that's uh, that's that's insane. I reckon I could pull my Clio, but because <laughs> you could literally go outside now and probably pick my car up. I've picked cars up. Yeah, I think my heaviest car lift was four hundred and four kilos. I feel like we should do this after the podcast. I feel like we should. <laughs> I don't want you to get injured. Though. No, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, you pulled. Was it forty seven tons? Yeah, forty seven. It was How? the amateur British uh, championships up in um, Billingham, I think it was. Um, and basically, they brought. This it's a forklift crane, basically. Uh, and literally, they put the harness on, and it's just everything you've got. So it's 20 metres. But again, it's the hardest part is getting it moving, but mm. obviously no handbrakes on, no gears. So as soon as it gets going, it's just momentum, basically. As long as you keep your legs going, it comes down to muscle fatigue then. Yeah, so how does that work then, in like the physics of it? Because, you know, um, a man weighing 160, 70 kilos shouldn't physically be able to pull... 47 tons um i think it's all done basically just on angles and things like that so when you start going same as if you're going to push your car you take the handbrake off and put the gears out relatively easy to get it going on the flat yeah and like i said by the you know by the time you've done five six meters you can actually build up to a run exactly the same it's just obviously instead of just using our legs we're given a rope to use the upper body yeah. as well so most of it's momentum then yeah it's basically as soon as it gets going like i said the heavier you are so, like, when I'd done the UKs, I think I weighed in 178 kilos. Shit. Um, I'm pretty probably, sure what Eddie Hall was about that weight in his prime. Uh, Eddie Hall in his prime was 210, I think. Was Shit. he? Shit. Yeah, when he won the Worlds, I think he was 200... No, 200 kilos he was, just shy of 200 kilos. <sighs> we'll, uh, we'll touch on that, on that later, yeah. the whole weight <laughs> thing, but again, anyway, sorry, go on. But yeah, so it's, it's literally just a case of trying, you said, you haven't just got your legs to go, you've got your upper body, you're pulling it as well, which gives you a lot more force. Mm. And again, it's it's the technique of get going. So, I mean, if you just had a rope and a belt around your waist, you're probably not going to move it. Because we get the harness, it goes over your shoulders, wraps around your, your waist and your stomach. You're able to put 100% of your force through the, the rope, basically. Mm. And then, like I said, it's just a case of, if you're a rugby player, perfect, because it's scrummaging, basically. Mm. You're in the scrum position for the 20 metres, 30 metres, however you've got to pull it. But there are events, right? I've seen an event, it was the... And the class, no, the the Rogue Invitational, the one that Lee sees won. Yeah. And there was a there was a thing with, oh, like a massive contraption, right? And you had to. It was similar to the thing you picked up, Weird but it had thing. sand in it, so it you couldn't build momentum. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, again, it's Rogue are oh, they're off 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 their heads. Like there's something wrong with them. Mm. They <laughs> they're just like making to, life really yeah, hard. Yeah, they for you. like going <laughs> above and beyond. But I said, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. Same with like Glenn Ross. His kit isn't normal. He likes things to look big, so yeah. it stands out. It looks like it was like a three million pound machine. Yeah, sort of thing, it's, you know? uh, like I said, it's. I think is that the one with the? It's like it looks like the Conan's wheel, but they're pushing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Called, I think yeah, it's yeah called, that's the thing. They're pushing it. Yeah, it's yeah. called the wheel of pain. I think it's called. the wheel oh, of pain. That's yeah. it. The wheel of pain. That sounds, that sounds um, fun. <laughs> doesn't look too difficult but oh my god but yeah apparently because it's got sand in it you can't build momentum yeah. you're constantly having to work constantly wheel. got the same tension on like I said with the uh, truck pull it's completely different because the wheels go so as soon as it is rolling mm. for some strange reason strongman promoters love putting a little bit of an incline at the end of your uh, truck pull so you've got to build up a decent amount of momentum to try to get up that hill yeah um, but again it's not it's not a stupid gradient but yeah but it's, it's pretty much once you go in it's momentum yeah, it must be nice for them because they don't have to do any of the weight weightlifting, oh, really, no. do they? Well, like I say with um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> what I like about like competing for the ultimates, like Glenn Ross is the one who does all the ultimates. I mean, he's a previous competitor himself, so he knows exactly what it takes to do the events. I would admit some of the events he put in this year, like the the dash and truck pull. Oh my god! We have to run with the truck, do you? Yeah. Oh no. So basically, you start at the truck. You got to run thirty meters to your platform, and that's when we're doing the sit down pull on the final day. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, I see, oh, I see that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. God. I said I'm not exactly built for running. I said I don't. I haven't <laughs> run properly in years. Yeah. So and then I said putting us on wet floor as well wouldn't the best. Yeah. But like some of his events, like the Conan's wheel. Normally, you pick that up, you can just plod along. It's hard to breathe, but you can plod to keep it. 
So it's done for distance. This year he done speed. Who mm. can do one whole revolution the quickest? And so he'll he'll mix it up. It says, and same with rogue. Like, you know they want something that stands out. It's not just a generic. Like you can go to some like the novice comps. Always the same five events. You said you got your deadlift, your log, farmers, yoke, stones. Always the same. With these other big shows, they want things that stand out. So as I said, it just brings people into the sport now. Yeah, there's a lot with strongman that I find as well. Like very much depends and this is why it seems very complex to figure out who is the strongest man in a certain region and in the yeah. world because you've got people with different leverages you could go in and if for example pressing movements if there was a world's strongest man and it was all based on like log press and stuff you know luke stockman is going to be better for that yeah. however things that require leverages deadlifts uh, Atlas Stones, you know, Tom Stockman would be better for stuff like that. And yeah. there's obviously like the rest of them, but I don't know them all. But and their leverages. But that's the thing, see, like the way that the competition is set up and the events that are chosen completely determines who is going to be the strongest. Oh, 100%. So I say nine times out of ten, the five events you tend to find, you've got the athletes who excel at like two, maybe two events. So you can't just be good at deadlift or log press. You've got to be sort of well-rounded. Mm. So you tend to find there's arguments over, like I said, obviously you've got world's strongest man and whoever wins that, like I said, obviously Tom Storm has won the last two years. But they also reckon whoever wins Arnold, Ohio, obviously that is the heaviest show in the world. Yeah. And now Rogue are starting to creep up at doing heavier shows Trying again. Trying to get their hand in the ring, So... To say who is the actual strongest man in the world, it comes down to the day, basically. Hmm. You could put five people, equal strength, equal ability on every single event, and it'll come down to who's mentally better. You know, you make one mistake, yeah. that could have cost you first, second, and third place. Yeah. Um, it happened to me this year now, both well, Wales' strongest men this year. I messed up two events, and it dropped me off podium place down to sixth. Um, so I said, if you can turn up and you can put the performance in on all five events unless someone is physically better than you nine times out of ten that's enough to take a trophy yeah but I said one miss you, know, you mess up one event that could cost you you know you could knock down four or five places mm. so again it all depends on like I said your mental readiness so uh, a lot of strongmen now are going through sports psychologists to try and get mentally prepared for yeah. the event Luke Stormont's a big one he's a big advocate with his uh psychologist now trying to get controlled aggression at the bar he never mm. used to be aggressive when he lifted now he's bringing that in he went and won Europe's strongest man yeah that was that last year the year before yeah so as I said it's, it's more mental than actual physical I find on the day um, like I said if you don't make a mistake the likelihood is unless someone is physically better you're taking a trophy home yeah, I was going to ask about that because um, obviously, you know, he spoke about mental preparation and obviously Eddie Hall, you know, pulled 500. Yeah. He attributed that to a lot of his mental preparation. You know, the yeah. whole like imagining your, you know, he, your children um, are stuck under a, a burning car or something. Yeah, I think I watched the documentary. Apparently he, he was going in and be like, being like proper hypnotized into when he touches that bar, a scenario was actually clicked into his head so he doesn't see the bar. All he sees, he won't see what he had put into his head in order to lift that weight. But yeah, he went through loads. He went through, obviously, the sports psychologist telling him to believe in him, he can do it. Um, and I said, being hypnotised, I said, something to do with triggers. Mm. And his trigger was basically, when he grabs the bar, in his head... His son everything's is like about to die. Or yeah, his wife it's, 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 your kids are under the car. Or he didn't say that. what it was, but it's probably something like that. Yeah, right? it's, it's, he said apparently it was bad. Um, yeah, because I've, I've heard that he said he saw some... He, he was like... You could see in his eyes. He wasn't there. Oh, no. He, he said he picked the deadlift up and he said he woke up as he as he was stood at the top. That's why he was holding for so long. But, again, everyone's different. I, I've tried that method where I go to the bar and I'm like, right, my kids are... It doesn't work for me. Yeah, that's what um, my next question was. How do you mentally prepare? I'm more of a class clown. I will annoy everybody. I will laugh and joke until I literally walk out. And then... So pret pretend the, the pressure isn't as high as it is and just sort of... Oh, I know the pressure's there. It's just I like to have a laugh and a joke. If I go, it's like, if I go backstage now in the change rooms, put my earphones in, try and... So, I just don't have sort of the pump to go out. I like to go out and then when I get to the bar, I send a switch off from the crowd and I literally just think about my, my kids. Mm. And like, if I lift this now, they'll be proud of me. And that's pretty much all I do. I don't... The aggression side doesn't work for me. I've tried being slapped on the back... And I almost wanted to hit my training partner. Uh, it, that's that sort of stuff doesn't yeah, work. Like a chair, yeah. <laughs> smashed over the like, back. You, you see them all the time. People getting slapped, and they are 
like maps. proper like, yeah, yeah it's yeah. not bigger power lifting like you say you'll see this yeah yeah before meet. deadlifts and stuff and like I'm that like, no, someone tried it with me once, and after that, I was like, no, I don't, <laughs> don't ever do that. Don't ever I do will that again. literally be until I'm at the bar, I'm laughing and joking. Yeah, I said, I do whatever it takes to keep relaxed. And then I said, I switch on when I hit the bar. Then I said, Think of my kids. I said, If they, you know, because they nine times out of ten, unless it's a big show, they're in the crowd watching. So all I think of is that they'll be what their reaction is when I lift this weight. You know, they love going to school town, their teachers. So that's what I think about when I'm at the bar. Yeah, the, the, the accomplishment that their father's made. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I tend to do. I say everybody's different. Um, I know people that put music on and they don't t- turn it off until they're about to walk out. And mm. if they're allowed to lift with it on, they keep their music in. Um, like I said, then you've got the aggression people. Everybody's different. It's whatever suits you. It's whatever keeps you calm enough in order to go out, lift the weight. I said, mm. you've got to be very good at controlling your aggression in order for someone to slap yeah. you on the back as hard as they normally do. Is that uh, so, so? What do you think then? Is the is that a pattern then among the top guys? I'm talking Brian Shaw, Hafthor, Eddie Hall, um, you know, all, all the, the 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 top athletes, Lee Like, what 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 do you think it is that that, that allows them? Because Brian Shaw seems like the most relaxed, calm person yeah. ever. How would you think he manages to build up so, that? If you Energy. watch a lot of his training videos, it's, again, he's the same. He seems to be, not so much laughing at joke, but he's very relaxed while he's waiting to go out, while he's walking. But then when he lifts, like I said... Carl, you look at him, he's a different he's, man. He's, yeah, he's got, a con- he's got controlled aggression when he lifts. Like yeah. In the gym, he, he shouts when he lifts. It's every time, it's ah, every single time he lifts. And he does exactly the same in the show. So whatever he does in his shows, yeah. that's how he trains. So, again... The top guys, Lissus, doesn't seem to be very aggressive when he comes to the bar. He's, like I said, when you watch his training videos, in between every every set, he's laughing and joking, messing about. Brian Shaw seems to be very serious with it. I mean, I know it's hard when you watch him with Eddie Hall, because Eddie Hall is definitely like you in the sense that yeah. laughing and joking. Like oh, he, yeah. He's pissing everyone off, you know, winding oh, people up. Oh, God, out. yeah. He likes, well, he said it in his own document, he likes to be sort of like the wolf and gladiators. He likes to be the person that annoys everybody else. Brian Shaw seems to have taken this like this. This is a full time career. Yeah, everything in his life is tailored to strongman. He yeah. wants that fifth. He's title. done it for like forever, hasn't he? Yeah, but well, he wants his fifth title basically. Yeah, yeah. I reckon he'll stop after that. He's getting on now, and he's forty something. To be honest, yeah, I think he's coming up to forty now. He masters soon. So, with the talent coming up, I'm not gonna. I don't know if he'll get it. I mean, he's gonna have to go above and beyond anything he's ever. Do you reckon done. Tom will get it again? If he does it next year. To be honest, he's got a good shot, but like, he's, he's two times now. now. Two, two times, times yeah. Um, but Lissus is back. Um, you've got apparently have you Novikov. There? Novikov is there. Kiliskovsky is coming back. Mm. He's yeah. finally over his injuries, and like, he's one of my all-time favourites. He's, he's that guy's a freak of nature. Mm. Well, everyone um, is. I tell you what, fair. though, while we're on uh, Alexei Novikov, Ukrainian, he was fighting on the front line for his country. Yeah. Came and competed at the Arn- Arnold's yeah. and came second. And then went back to the front. Was it second? Yeah. Was he second? Uh, I think, think he came yeah. second to Lee Seas and then Arnold gave him the prize money as yeah. well because of everything that was going on. He'd done it with a couple of Giants live shows as well. He's flying back and forth. He wasn't able to train properly. He was just flying back for the ships. Yeah, from, from the front line and then competing and yeah. smashing everyone. Yeah, honestly. And he's only like 25. Yeah, from what I've heard about him, I, said, I, haven't, I, said, I haven't got into the Giants live scene just yet. I'm hoping to break into it either next year or the year after. Apparently one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet as well. Mm. Like I said, he is down to earth. He doesn't bring in this whole, you know, the Ukraine situation. Or like he said, he's very down to earth. He'll mm. have time for everybody. Yeah, he Most seems of like the nice athletes guy. I know are all like that. Yeah, They'll take time out of their own day. Now, Eddie Hall's got that reputation of arrogance. And no, one's, no one's as good as me. Now, he refereed me at Europe's Strongest Man in 2018. Eddie Hall? Yeah. Oh, cool. Like nothing more daunting than going out for a, a three hundred kilo deadlift and having, <laughs> and having a look at it in his yeah. eyes, like. Yeah. yeah. But like, he wasn't paid to be there, and he offered to stay behind for the spectators to come onto the field, and do meet and greets and everything. He'd done that off his own back. Mm. Like what you see on TV a lot of the time is a persona. Like Eddie Hall's thing you see on TV is persona. Mm. Meet him in real life, one of the nicest guys you ever meet. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So it's. Again, because obviously with the sport, there's not much money. You need to be popular in order to get your sponsorships. You need you to know. have businesses, you yeah. know, like Brian Shaw does, like Eddie well, yeah. Hall does. I they mean, don't have their money from, from the competitions. No. They have their name from the competitions. Eddie's, don't they? Yeah. Eddie was one of the rare cases. He did manage to find that financial sponsor. Mm. Uh, he, he said, he said it's on a documentary, like, he managed to settle a couple of sponsorships where he was able to leave work and be a full-time strongman. 
not very often you can do that. Most strongmen that I know and compete against either have full time jobs or they own their own gyms. Like companies, like I said, like I said, I'm with Cerberus. I mean, they help out, so I don't have to pay for the safety kit I use, my clothing. You know, so it helps out with me not having to work as much. Mm. But I've still got to have a full time job in order just to compete. Yeah. Like if I retire tomorrow, I retire from work as well. I work in order to compete. Yeah. My food bill, I said, trying to pay for my food. I'm looking wow. yeah, yeah. fifty pound a week without feeding my other half who also competes and my two kids. Yeah. Um, you know, then you got travelling to competitions. Very rare I compete in Wales. Most of my competitions are well, UK strongest man now is in Nottingham. Mm. Um so there's a lot of travel. You've got hotel expenses. So the only thing that's ever paid for me is when I go to UK's, Glen Ross, in fairness, all you pay is your fuel. Your food's covered. Your hotel's covered. Everybody wins some sort of prize money, which, like I said, covers the fuel and a bit extra. Yeah. But, yeah, most of the guys I know, like even Gavin, uh, Gavin Henson. The rugby player. Gavin Bilton. Um, he is by far number one in Wales. Mm. You know, he goes to Wales Strongest Man religiously. Um He's got his own gym, and I think he does bouncing on the weekends as well. You know, so he's, <laughs> he's a wouldn't monster. be surprised. Even he, he's not. How tall yeah, is he? Six foot five, six foot six. Oh, he's a monster. Jeez, he's huge. He's actually got the world record for the heaviest ever athlete to compete with world's strongest man. What to be the heaviest? How, how heavy is he then? Is he um, two hundred plus? He's not two hundred plus, is he? He's got his first be. world's strongest man. He was two hundred and ten. He's now one hundred and eighty-four. So he's dropped weight now in order to be healthy. But, I mean, if you stand next to him, oh, like, when people see me, they class me as a big lad. I'm only 5'11", so I'm short for a strong man. But yeah. like, you put me next to Gavin, I, I look like a child. I mean, the guy is a monster of a man. Mm. And again, he's one of these ones where screams a lot on the when he's out on the floor. And Control aggression. I like but, his moustache. He's got oh, the, the yeah. coolest vibe. Mario, mm. everyone goes with him. <laughs> the man yeah. as well, Mario. He's, but... In person, he will take time out of his day to, like I say, if you went up to his gym and said, oh, any chance you could, he'll stop his training. He's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Yeah. Where is his gym? We should, we should um, go. It's Area 51 up in Caffilly. Caffilly. I've Absolutely. heard of that gym. Have you? Absolutely amazing. It is. It's only, like I said, it's only a small one. But it said it's strong man. You don't tend to find large strong man gyms because you only need specialist equipment. You need a squat rack, a deadlift platform, mm. and pretty much most of your stuff then just somewhere to move. You just need like a barn or something to, yeah. to run them back and forth. In or an aeroplane uh, or something like that. Yeah, yeah or a plane <laughs> hangar. <laughs> but I said, with I said, people like Gavin, he said, everyone thinks, oh, God, they're going to be quite scary. But I remember when my uh, youngest was born, he was still serving in the army. Took her to DW so they could obviously meet her when she was born. Uh, he was crying when he met her. Oh. He's, he's a really soft person. He's, And I said, he's... In person, completely different to what you see on TV. He comes yeah. across as like a fan fate, but he's even nicer in person. So let me ask you this then, because obviously you've touched on a couple of people now, Eddie Hall being an absolute gentleman, yeah. Garvin. How do you think, why do you think this is then? Because you've got the strongest men on the planet, some of the most scary looking men on the planet. Well, you, yeah, you're you know, strongest as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. Look at your capabilities. Yeah, you could literally kill somebody. Well, how how do you how do you, why do you think then that strong men are in sports generally more sort of supportive of each other, kind to people? Why is that such a big thing in strong man, despite think, being the biggest and strongest yeah, in the world? I think a lot of it's come down to the fact that like, you look at footballers. I mean, everybody could name you five or six footballers. Strong man is a very small niche sport. Mm. You know, I mean, like I said, we don't have the athletes in there where we get paid year round things like that. So it's a very small community, so you get to know everyone quite well. Like I said when we were talking earlier, you go to the gym, you've got your your opponents cheering for you to lift more in a competition. Yeah, you see that a lot. Yeah, so like I've gone to I've, every show I've gone to, like I said, the competition is based on what I've done. I as I said, it's a single sport, it's up to me. But on the day, I'll have someone who's gone out and say done ten reps on the deadlift. That person said stood next to me, I've done ten, and he goes, Do one more, one more and you've beaten me. Mm. and it's just a completely different, a different atmosphere I love it like same with every sport you do get the ones that are sort of you know sit in the corner and they're not I won't go into how bad they are but you know but the same as every sport but yeah. nine, name, I name five say, people you think yeah. do that. name the top <laughs> five divas in strong man oh there's quite a few <laughs> but even, even said even those ones like, it's, some of them do they withdraw from themselves and I said after the comp then they'll come and talk to you but I said they stay in there but I said I'd probably say 95% of the strong men I've competed against they're there screaming for their opponent to lift mm. more. 
Um, and I've seen a lot more of it now because I've been refereeing a bit more as well. Yeah. Uh, with the underweight categories. And again, you see it. They're, they're all there screaming and shouting for their opponent. Yeah. So I said, it's, it's just because it's a small sport, I think you just get friendly with everybody. Like I said, if you go on to most strong, like top level strongmen, they know who most of the other strongmen are. Yeah. Um, like I've turned up to a show, don't know any of them. Because I tend to, I got my little bubble. I know the strong men that I know. I stick to that. I don't really go through social media scanning. But I'll turn to the show and they all know who I am. Because they've all seen me either on TV or follow me on Instagram or something like that. And I said, instantly you just click and you, it's as if you're training with your training partner. Uh, and it's always been the same. That I've, Since I've started the sport, it's been, it says, it's always the same way. Yeah, there seems to be a, a tight knit community in the strongman in the strongman scene. Yeah, you know, you you don't really see that in bodybuilding. There's obviously niche communities, but everyone seems to be quite friendly, or the yeah. large majority of people seem quite friendly. Yeah, it says the same. Like I said, with like I said, we train down in uh, Celtic Strength in Clydeck, so we've got a group of us that are sort of like strongman. You've got the powerlifters that have come over, and again. We've jumped in with the powerlifters, so, so I've done done dabbling a little bit of powerlifting just to annoy them. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but I said even the powerlifters are exactly the same. Everyone. So say now I go down there, and I said right, I'm going to attempt a PB on on deadlift. Every time I attempt that bar from say 280 up, the whole gym will stop and scream for me to lift that weight. Yeah. So I said it's just a nice community. I said I said because it's that small niche niche sport. I said, everybody knows everybody. I said, it's also one of the sports, like I said, if you do something wrong, or the sport knows about it. Yeah. You know, you can't, so I if, say I do something that's really bad down here, most of the people in the sport will know. How do you, when you say bad, how do you mean? Like, what? like just in your personal life, you say anything. Yeah. So, you know, you do a hit and run. I said, all oh, right, okay. So some, anything, basically, okay. Your, your life is known pretty much all throughout. So, you know, one strong man knows. If they tell one, then it's obviously escalated. Yeah. I said, obviously, it's reached the most, majority of the strong man world within a week. That must be yeah. That so, must be weird. It's like people knowing your life all the time. Oh yeah, I said if if you if you're one of these people that post up your entire life on social media, most of the strong men you turn up and they could probably tell you everything about your life. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. They, it's, it's such a small community. So what you'll tend to find. So say now I was to compete against used to, most of the time. You'd can stand we, no, can we, can you'd stand we, no can chance. We, can we compete as one person? <laughs> yeah, you'd stand no chance against us. <laughs> so <those. laughs> what a lot of athletes will do, will, they'll go onto your social media, they'll see, right, okay, you've uploaded the deadlift video of comp prep, and they're like, okay, well, he's managed about six or seven. So they'll study what you can do as well. Yeah. So by the time you get to comp, they know what you've been training, how you've been training. So, again, people tend to use tactics as well that way. So they're like jealous ex girlfriends and sort of sc- much, yeah. sort of scanning uh, scanning your social yeah, media. I don't know. So if I if, if I don't, if there's not a name there, I don't know. I'll have a look up and I'll see roughly what they can do. Um, but yeah, this is where I tend to like to play a few mind games. So I don't show my best lift. So if I'm doing three sets of five, I'll film all three. And whichever one looks like I struggled the most, that's the one that gets lo- loaded. You got other athletes then that will post their best lift to try and like. Yeah. yeah, put their chest out. I've known athletes to uh, put fake weights on. Well, not fake weights, but what they'll do is they'll load the bar up and say, oh, this is 400 kilos. It's like 340. I always wonder about this. I always wonder why powerlifters, bodybuilders, and strongmen, bodybuilders especially, actually, I always wonder why they keep posting exactly what they're doing. Like, you're just letting other people know what they need to do in order to beat you. I always wonder why people do that. You only see a snippet. So like, if you look at a lot of my videos, you never actually see an entire session. So I'll have, so I'll say it's the deadlift day, and I'll show you my worst top set of deadlift, mm. and I might show you my second one, and then maybe my event at the end. But what I haven't shown you is the bit I do in the middle, which is where most of the, like I said, my conditioning work, endurance, muscular endurance work, I keep all that separate. And I said, if I'm going in and it's a comp run through, I might show you a warm up. I won't show you what I've done with the comp weight. But you act like it's the, the comp weight. Yeah. Thing. So basically, people might think, oh, he struggled a bit with that. And I, I will deliberately put a bad video up. So people think, oh, he's only managed two reps on the deadlift, but really I've just done like 15. So in other words, you can't trust Matt Diamond. No. no. <laughs> but like I said, if I, put a weight, no, no, if I put the weight on, whatever weight I've written on my post, that's the weight I've actually lifted. Yeah. But I don't want to show the best of me, especially leading up to a competition. You know, because if I put the best, my, my say my best video on deadlift, and I've struggled to get five reps, and you've got Paul Smith who can come in and he's like he's in the gym going, well, I'm doing ten at the moment. Yeah, he's going to be a lot more relaxed coming into that show. Wouldn't that be? 
Yeah, no, I was going to say, wouldn't that be a good thing? Because then they'd get complacent. It is, but if that is my best one, so where they think that's obviously how I'm lifting, when they then, you do the first event, so say now I'm putting up a video and I struggled with my first set, I only managed like five. Mm. But on my next set, I'm a bit more warm, a bit looser, and I've gone and done 12. Mm. If I show you the five and he's doing 10, he's going to come out and go, well, he's only going to do five, I might do eight, beating him. Yeah. And then I come out and bang, I've done 12. Yeah. The next event then, he's gonna, it's a mental game. It's not so much that event, it's the following events. So there's a bit of chess involved, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of mind games. Like you still, you still, you still got the close atmosphere, like I said, cheering each other on. But like I said, just that little mental edge. Like I said, I don't care. When it comes to comp day, I'll cheer everyone on, but I'm going there for first place. Of course so you are, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. turn up to any show and think, oh, as long as I can get on the podium. Like, the only show I've done that with was the UK's, and that's because I've, like I said, we were talking earlier, I come off of like, bad medical news last year i was even lucky to be at uk's so my goal was make day three the mm. fact that i placed sixth i was ecstatic that's a hey, that's a huge achievement so i was over the moon mm. um i said the last year like medically wise um like i was told november last year i'll be dead in six months shit yeah really I mean, yeah i've got a really i've got a kidney disease called nephrotic syndrome now you can have two versions of it there's one you can catch as a child um course of steroids clears it up done when you get an ad as an adult, you're looking at either kidney transplant, medication for the rest of your life, or I was told with how severe my symptoms were, I had six months. So, so what's the deal now then? Are you, are you okay now? Yes and no. So basically I went for a kidney biopsy. Turns out I've got a very rare version of it. I still have the child's version. So what they think is I caught it when I was a child and I had problems with my legs. So big symptom is your legs swell because the protein you eat leaks into your body. So I let you look at Mr. Bob, he's had a bee sting. <laughs> so, so they've done the biopsy, they said, I've, they think I caught it as a child, wasn't picked up, so it went dormant. I went harder than I'd ever gone for a show when I won the Welsh, and they think basically it flared up. So it will constantly flare up now for the rest of my life, whenever I go hard over the top. So lucky enough, it's literally following my consultant, she gives me a six-week course of steroids, it'll go back down. And I said... That's just pure luck that I had the child's version. So if it was the adult's version, I said I probably wouldn't have even been at UK's. Um, and they said the chance of a kidney transplant within that short of time was just non-existent. So, so you you went from being told that you have six months left to live to place in sixth in the UK. Yeah. That's quite like poetic in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, isn't it, really? Part of it was, I knew I, well, we judged everything based on that six months and we said, right, I probably wouldn't make it to UK's, but... I, me and my partner agreed I wasn't going to stop training and I would try and do at least one more com competition before that six months was up. Mm. Shit. Um, we were just lucky that within the said two months the results come back and we found out obviously it wasn't that bad. So lucky enough keeping the training going. But uh, yeah, I said to turn up to UKs and get sixth, that, yeah. I was over the moon. Like I said, I, whenever I go to a show, I have three goals. I have the bare minimum I'm happy with. My main focus, which like I said for me was eighth. And then I like to have that, like I said, that one goal, which is a little bit of a dream, but it's possible. If I go in there and do my best ever performance, and that was it, UK's would have been a podium. Mm. And I said, if you look at the final day, I messed up the seated truck pull. Oh, that was awful. Mm. I, I'm usually pretty good at that event. I messed that up major flagpole. Never even touched that event. I've never, you, you can't train it. Yeah. That didn't go well. Um, but like other events did so like I said if I we worked out the points so I was, if I had done as well as I should have done in the truck pull and oh what was the other event I didn't do good in it was one of the other ones then um, I would have actually taken second the points would have added up so I went from like messing up two events two or three dropped me from second to sixth mm. Mm. like with a squat I actually placed second in that I think I was third in the overhead the block press so I was placing certain events, placing quite high. It's just because obviously, that, like I said, the truck pull. I think I was last. Yeah. I mean, you know, I went out, grabbed the rope, nylon rope, wet rope as well. Chalk was no good, so I just physically couldn't get the truck going. Yeah. But again, everything when you go to comp day is completely different. Yeah. So what was going through your head then? Obviously, when you were told that news, what was like? You must have been thinking, "Oh shit!" Uh, when I first got them, I kind of uh, denied it at first. I said, like, oh, "I'll be fine. I'll be fine." And then obviously when it started sinking in, like depression and anxiety has been sort of like in my life for quite a while. So yeah, since I got injured yeah. when I was younger. 
So trying to overcome that. Lucky enough, like I said, everything I do now is basically for my girls. So they kept me sort of like level headed and but yeah, it, it knocked me for six. When he when he said it, I was like Shit, and yeah. I was sort of like one of those moments he said it and I kinda of just froze. I was like, He didn't really say that, did he? I was like took me about a week to come around fully to the idea. Yeah. So at that point I just said, Right, I've accepted it. I'm still gonna train because I wanna um but we were planning everything basically around the kids, right? Screw work, I'll do the bare minimum work and we're gonna go do this, 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 and this. Fuck um, yeah. that must be insane. Yeah, it was basically trying to get as much in to do with my kids as I physically could. And I said it was just I said, sheer luck that I happened to have mm. contracted the So child what about now me. then? Because obviously strong man, it's not exactly the healthiest lifestyle, you know. You're you're really heavy. It's gonna have an effect on your body. So like how how do you feel about everything now in terms of your health? Like your health wise now, so basically everything I do now is teetering on health. So I said, I'm nowhere near what I used to. I've dropped over 20 kilos in body weight already. Uh, I'm aiming to do another 15 now uh, before I do the competition in February. Mm. So I'm also looking into sort of the, the longevity training. So I'm doing a lot more endurance work. I fast every day for 12 hours just to keep my body a bit healthier, if mm. that makes sense. So like, the idea is drop down to about 140, 145 in body weight. So I'll be a lot more mobile. And obviously with the endurance training, I've been doing four endurance sessions a week on top of my weight training. So that'll keep obviously healthy, fitter. So even moving at that body weight, mm. I'll be able to do that for a lot longer. Um, I only plan on competing for another two or three years, maybe that fourth year if I break into Giants and maybe Worlds. Once I've done that, I will literally just plummet in body weight down to about 115. So for now, because obviously I don't plan on doing this, like a lot of athletes will say, I'm going to go into the Masters. I have no intention of being a Masters athlete. It's good you're honest about that and, and you're self-aware about it. My logic is like my girls now, I've got an eight-year-old, a three-year-old. By the time I sort of like three, four years, like my eldest now, she wants to compete in netball, karate. She now wants to start rugby. I've had my time basically the way I look at it. So by the time she gets to sort of 10, 11, 12, she's going to want to be traveling to compete. Not physically possible with the amount I train, my partner trains, we travel. So we both agreed when she starts competing properly, I'm done. I, I respect will, that a lot. I'll retire and then, like I said, I've had, I would have had 35 years to do what I want. I, I said I've competed high level rugby, I used to skateboard, now doing strongman. It's quite a jump, skateboarder, strongman. Yeah, I sort of, uh, <laughs> that's, that's well cool. I was a skateboarder in school. I actually picked up a sponsorship when I was, uh, when I was 17. All right, okay. Um, unfortunately, I have an agreement I had with my parents when I was in sixth form. If I messed about in school, I joined the Navy. Well, I missed a biology lesson. So one, I, one. Well, no, I missed one. My parents said, if you miss another one, you're in the Navy. And I genuinely made a mistake on my plan. I thought it was like Wednesday. It was, it was Thursday. So I didn't turn up to the biology lesson, got home, and she goes, oh, you're in the careers office now tomorrow. <laughs> That's so brutal. Escape on a career done. Yeah. Um, joined the Navy, and I was the first time I ever started playing rugby. Didn't play rugby till I was like 17. Mm. Um, I ended up turning pro with that, signed up for the with the Navy. Uh, I did play a bit for Flandovery before I got injured again. But, and I said, after all the injuries, I just want to play for fun then. Yeah. And I, like I was saying to you earlier, tore my calf uh, during a game, so I was told six months recovery, so I could still weight lift. I was literally training in RD's gym with my partner, went for uh, the 50 kilos to, I was doing sets of 10 with them. And the guy that was using them basically told me about a competition he was entering, done my first show, and that's it. I retired from rugby completely, went straight to strongman. But, yeah, I transitioned from sport to sport, and now once this is done, I'll still train, but instead of tra I do five weight sessions a week, four endurance sessions a week, that'll drop. I'll literally train three hours a week. Yeah. Just enough to maintain a healthy healthy lifestyle, and then it's all about what the kids want to do then. Then they'll be stepping on stage then for bodybuilding, but, bodybuilding shows. We actually, <laughs> funny enough, we actually thought about that this year now we were thinking is strongman the best way to go health wise well I don't know That's, if bodybuilding is much better I physically can't do it anyway because I ruptured the bicep yeah. I've got I didn't have it repaired so I'd never do well in but because I've got this bicep's like all the way up here so Ow. so I have no symmetry in my arms so power lifting I might dabble in that a little bit, but yeah, you did it a day before your show. Yeah, <laughs> that's like, class. Again, that was purely oh, just because for fun. Well, I'm going to go to. I'm qualified for Britons now, and the idea was to go to Worlds. So, the powerlifters in my gym said, "I oh, will do strong man. It can't be that difficult. We'll show you how it's done." So I thought, "That's oh, right. Then I'll do a bit of powerlifting to annoy you lot." <laughs> 
and we've looked at generally what I'm capable of doing. So the idea is for worlds, I'm going to go for the world record in all three lifts and the total. <laughs> so you're just it's really <laughs> you're just off. doing power lifting just to piss someone just to off. Piss them off yeah. Sounds like Alex not. That's something you would do. Alex. It was something I would do. Actually. I literally plan. So I think right now, British record is a thousand kilo total. So I plan on doing a thousand and one at the British, <laughs> and then at the Worlds I'm going for eleven hundred. <laughs> so what are you going to do? How are you going to split them up? Are you going to do like um, for the eleven hundred? I think it worked out. It's a two fifty bench. That's, if anyone can hear that, that's a helicopter flying, and Matt's going to tow that <laughs> down, down the street. Um, I was trying to work out what it was. I think it was 440 squat. 440 squat. And that's that's how much we saw that bloke squat in Welsh and Barbell. And this yeah. guy picked up 442.5. On a Sunday morning. Yeah, squat yeah, day. yeah fucking mad. I think it was something like a 440 deadlift as well. Something like that to get to. to I think I've, I've got the numbers written down on what I need, but yeah. it'll give me 1,100 kilo total. 1,100 would be 450, 450, 250, wouldn't it? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. Because 900 and then 300 yes, and yeah. 200. No, oh, no, it wouldn't 200, be. 200, no. It'd be less. It'd be like 425, 425, 425, 425 250. That's so, insane. Like bench. Oh, easy then. Yeah. Days work. I don't even uh, think I could squat. No, I, I don't think I could squat 250. I definitely can't squat 250. That's crazy. I currently, never... my, obviously, deadlift is 370. My current squat, I've done th- 345, but it was, again, it was a very fast rep. Yeah. And that was in knee sleeves, not my wraps. Um, and my bench, I've done a 200 bench, um, but I'm working with a guy from Pembrokeshire Powerlifting. Okay. Aaron, Aaron Hoskins, he's like one of the best. I've heard, I've heard of him. Yeah. Oh, he's an absolute animal, God. He's insane. Um, but he's tweaking my technique. So... Lead up to a powerlifting comp, I might bench for three or four weeks, and then I don't bench again. I don't need a strong man, so I haven't trained it for years. So I literally, I use tricep and front shoulder power from log press in order to bench the 200. Yeah. So he's working on technique with me, and he goes, oh, within six months, you'll be doing 250. So like the bench is one I'm not worried about. Yeah, because it's the sort of same principles, isn't it, the whole pressing movement? Yeah, it's, it's literally, it's, it's more to do with... The bar path, and like I said, getting your shoulders pinned on the bench. So a lot of people, like I said, they've, when you unrack the weight, your shoulders come forward, which means that the stability factor is gone. Mm. So as you come down, you said you are wobbling a bit. So it's all about that and leg drive. I said I never even you think a bench press and said use your legs. I'm like what the heck? It's crazy. Yeah. When I started powerlifting, I was like flat backed. My legs, could, you, yeah. my legs might as well have been up in the air. Yeah, same here. Last <laughs> and press. I yeah. know. I know. Like... If you if you actually recorded <laughs> that w- the weight distribution will be in the bench, it's all through my upper back. Yeah. Nothing. I'm pr- I'm just touching the cloth for my tr- on yeah. my shorts on the bench. The rest so of it. One of the tips he goes, he goes, your back should hurt. Like, what do you mean my back? I'm not training. And the first time Pinching I tried this it. technique, oh my, my back was cramping. Mm. And yeah, so it's it like does. normally went, oh no, you've done it right then. Yeah, it's because of the protraction. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're tensing your, you know, your traps, you know, all the way through. And, and your yeah. scapula. Yeah, of course. You can't so have that retracted. Uh, yeah. So this is another thing he says, obviously, if you're training bench, you should always have a training partner to hand the weight off to you. Because as soon as you push up, you brought your shoulders forward. Trying to retract that back with... 100 kilos, 150 kilos in your hand, it's not going to happen. It is difficult, yeah. I mean, I personally, I quite like a rack in myself. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's difficult, though. If you did have somebody unload it for you, I feel like if somebody unloads it for me, I haven't sort of filled it out myself. Yeah, yeah. you need to so feel So then the all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't know what the weight feels Best like thing in my to hands. Do, like, one of the biggest bits of advice I've had, so like my training partner, he will hand the weight out to me. If he doesn't come to the show... I'll pick it up myself. <laughs> Casually. So You'd rather not have somebody else. Yeah, so basically there's different ways. Like some people literally pick all the weight up, hand it out, and then like put it Boom. on you. Yeah. Other people, so what he does is so say now my two hundred bench, he'll take thirty, maybe forty kilos worth of pressure off. So I'm like say one sixty is coming out. And then he'll go right your bar and he'll slowly put the weight into my hand. So I'm feeling the weight as it comes down. Yeah, instead of just and like yeah, uh, have it. He doesn't let go of the bar until I say, right, my bar, and then mm. he's off. So, yeah, you've got to be very careful about that. Like, I yeah. remember training with Anto, my coach, and you know he's. I remember the first time I I know it to him, he hated it. He was like, "Don't ever do that again. Yeah. I don't like it." So then he had to teach me exactly how he wanted yes, it. It yeah. was literally like, "Don't don't mess this up. I want you to do this, and then I will tell you when when to let it go. I'll tell yeah. you how quickly to move it out." It's very specific. It's, you know, people have a specific. Yeah, requirement. It's, it's one of those things. That everything needs to be perfect. 
like my training partner now, listen, he can, we tend to go to each other's shows. So he is a disabled athlete, basically. He's blind. So, oh, I've, I've seen this guy. You, you put it on, on your story. Yeah. Yeah. Lost. yeah. yeah. I, um, I, was, I wondered about that. Yeah. He competes powerlifting and strongman. Fair play. So, Fair play. How are you? How, that's how mad. You, do that? you must have really so, had some good. Basically, the condition he's got, uh, he's slowly losing his visions, but he's got, I think it's 8% vision. 8 8%. So basically, okay. if he's looking at you, he can see your face. You could literally put your head on his shoulder, he won't see you. So he's, it's like tunnel vision, basically. Yeah, that so, must be rough. Like, static events, he's fine with. Like, but when it comes to moving events, he's got to see what he's running at. So nine times out of ten, when we go into his shows, I'm actually his guide. So say now he's got so a big one for the disables is the dumbbell. So you will stand where he needs to I go, stand, and you like no, I stand behind him and grab his belt and move him. So oh, so you're allowed that? Isn't yeah, it? yeah, he's allowed a guy. Yeah, yeah, there are certain rules. Yeah, so our normal thing is, I said, if he's got distance to run, he's fine because he can see in the distance, so he can see that spot. But if there's things like a meter apart, he'll do the press. As soon as he comes down, I grab his belt, I let him run, and then basically if he's going to run road run, I literally just yank him back and put him in place. Yeah, and so it's things like that. Cool. But it's exactly the same as he same. does my handoffs at bench. Yeah. If he does if he can't make the show, the only other person I'll allow to do it is Aaron Hoskins. Mm. I don't like it otherwise. It's it said I'd rather unrack it myself and mm. risk having that little bit of a second or two. Yeah. So again, it's the same with strong manpower. Everyone's got things they would like how they like things done and it's gotta be exactly the same every time. Mm. Yeah, I'm really taken aback by by your training partner competing. Because a lot of people just make excuses to why they can't do things. Oh, no, do you know what I mean? Like a lot of people if you know if if that if that happened to someone else, I think probably ninety nine point nine percent of people would go, yeah. Oh I can't do it. To be honest, if you see his lifestyle now, to be honest, he's probably one of the most inspirational people I, I've met. Like he works at the gym religiously he's there from six till three every day, Monday to Friday. Yeah. Doesn't work weekends because he's also his kid's football coach. So he coaches... That's amazing. I think it's two different age groups in football teams. Yeah. And then obviously his kids are with like Swansea and Cardiff, so he's travelling all around the UK with them. But yeah, I think he's currently the British powerlifting champion for his weight class. And that's able body. There's no... There's no with powerlifting, he doesn't have... He's not in a disabled federation. There's no disabled federation for that because they're all static lifts. Yeah, you don't have to worry so about it. So he's yeah. currently the British champion for... I think it's under 82 kilos. He's now going into the under 90s now because his cut, cut court costs him so much strength. Um, strongman now. The problem with the strongman side of things is the disabled category is even smaller than the able-bodied. So there's no weight categories. Mm. So he went to the Arnold's. He qualified to go to Arnold's. He was the lightest person there by 30, 40 kilos. Wow, that's a lot. That's a discrepancy. Um, so, but in fairness, yeah, to that's him, like four weight categories. Yeah, it's it's a massive classes. difference. But he still he holds his own. He like said he's pressing the same weights. Like his deadlift, obviously, I think the world record now is like two hundred and eighty five, say for the disabled, and he's pulling two forty. But I said he's eighty five kilos in body weight. It's yeah. three times his body weight. But he's absolutely phenomenal to watch. But then again, you see the other athletes that turn up with other conditions. You have got people there with like one leg. One arm. I've seen that, yeah. And it's amazing. There's a, a young girl, she doesn't compete at the moment. She's only 15, I think. Her name's Phoebe. She comes and does um, like a halftime show with dead. So she's broken the world record on deadlift on almost every single show. But she's got, oh, I think it's motor neurons. But she's 15. MNS. M- yeah, MNS, is it? I think MNS? so, yeah. Um, I'll find out exactly later. But is it motor neuron syndrome? I think so, yeah. Called, yeah. But she turns up and she'll deadlift. I think she's got like a 60 kilo deadlift. I mean, she's small. She's not like, you know, big built like a lot of strong women are. And I said, she pulls that weight. But I said, you can see she's physically not able to walk properly. I said, she's... And you watch that, you come away. And I said, it's, I feel more inspiration watching that yeah. than the actual Arnold's. Yeah, you see you yeah. see videos online of people with like cerebral palsy. Yeah. And it's, they're like, you know, they can hardly stand up straight, yeah. and yet they're still managing to pull like 60 kilos or something like that off the floor. Yeah, exactly. It is inspirational. It's more inspirational than somebody watching me pull 250. But of course yeah. it is. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who is completely gifted genetically not like one of the one of the elite genetics yeah. but I mean not, not I've got yet. all my limbs. Yeah. I've got no medical conditions whatsoever. I'm healthy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and then you've got some people who don't deadlift or squat because yeah. oh, I mean, my knee hurts. Well, no, you just you just well, like, yeah. built, you just don't want to do it. It's like, technically, I'm allowed to compete in the disabled category. 
Really? Because uh, um, my I've had part of my kneecap removed on my left leg. So I've got a condition where my kneecap is still in three pieces. Um, and when I was in the Navy, the corner snapped off, so they've removed it. Ow. Um, and I've actually lost, I think they said it's about 30% use of the knee. The only thing holding my legs in place is the actual sheer muscle mass. Um, if I stop training, my leg, the pain in my legs increases. So. Yeah. But like, I went up there, I got asked if I'd referee the disabled for the Arnold's. I was over the most course. I watched day one, and we managed to catch the starting show for the actual Arnold Pro. We watched the first two events. I was like, this is just, it's just not the same. Like, if, I, if the disabled weren't there, it would have been an amazing show. But I said, the inspiration you see from these people... It all shadows it, does it? Yeah, I, I think, personally, they, they blow them out of the water. Yeah. And yeah, it's still the only category that didn't win prize money at the Arnold's. You think it'd be the opposite? So, the yeah, sort I, mean, of opposite. I mean, like I said, you've got wheelchairs. Um, one thing I obviously, until I met my training partner, I never knew they'd done seated deadlift. So like that, those, I've seen damaged. videos of that. That is the most bizarre looking exercise. I refereed the world record at the Arnold's. I think it's 666 kilos, something like that. 665 kilos, yeah. Deadlift. Yeah, but you kilos. sit down and you practice yeah. sit down and you practically pull it up. It's not you only pull it up a few inches. I think it literally comes off the floor about two. If you if, if you if you put the wrong bar on, you won't get the record because the plates will still touch the floor. It doesn't come up. But basically, it's a little metal seat like that, and they start with it under their feet and they rock back. So they've got to keep their back straight and physically lift this weight up. It's like a good morning, really. Yeah. So, but I think it was just was six, yeah, six sixty-five or something like that. That's insane. Absolutely, and it's. It, you probably could have done another 10, 20 kilos easy. Yeah. It's so inspiring to see like but, these, all these different stories you yeah. tell us. But as I said, you come over, you talk to me, you think obviously people, you know, they miss that. They'd have a chip on their shoulder. Nicest people in the world. Yeah. We had Americans come over and like, they were offering me, if I ever go to America now, let me know, no hotel, crash at their place. It's all good training with it. You know, they're absolutely amazing. I said, you, you think, I said, you, you said you get people oh, I've got a bit of a niggle in the shoulder I can't do this I've got a bad elbow yeah that. and they're like and, I chip my nail yeah <laughs> but they're like really sour and really like sort of like the world hates me because of this and then you go to the, like these events and you see these disabled athletes zero there's, excuses there's, there's no excuse whatsoever yeah. that you got those two types there's two types of people you come across they either find an excuse or they find a way yeah yeah. and it's sounding like a lot of the people you're talking about there are the people who just find a way oh, and that's so commendable it's amazing to watch I will admit I said no we got the um, I'm refereeing the British Disabled now again, which will be, I think it's June or July. It's the summer holidays, basically, so it's July, I think. Um, but now that it's getting a bit more popular, because obviously the Arnolds, we had, they done like come and try it. So you could actually sit down and see how they would teach you as an able body how to do the seated deadlift. I think I'd love to try um, that. I'd love to give that a go. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's it's bizarre. Bizarre. There was people there that couldn't pick up a seated deadlift. Like I said, they, their deadlifts were, they were saying, oh, I can deadlift 300. Yeah, we're struggling to pick up 200 kilos off the floor. Yeah. And you're like, it's obviously completely different muscles. and But yeah, it's a completely different atmosphere when you get there. Like I said, there's no the, there's no chips on the shoulder. Obviously, you've got the ones you think they might have a chip on the shoulder, but they're the ones that use the control aggression. Once the combat day is over, again, their personality switches back to normal. Yeah. And they're like, oh, how's things? Completely different person. Yeah. But like I said, they've gone there to win. Yeah, you, sorry, go on. Like I said, and some of them said, you obviously got, uh, there's a guy called Tiberius comes over from Germany. You've got the Americans coming over. I think there's people from Canada, you know, but they're self-funded as well. So, you know, if they turn up and they want to focus 100% on winning, especially if there's, like I said, no prize money, they're not getting anything for it. Mm. They get their goodie bags, obviously their trophies, and obviously the title of Arnold Classic champion. But, yeah, you do the pro show and there's prize money, you know, they get help funding to be travelled. You know, so for them to have that outlook when they're getting pretty much nothing for it, I think it's absolutely amazing. I would rather watch that than go and watch an able body show. Yeah, it's hard, see, because obviously you, you're paying to do this. Like, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we, we've, with our, our podcast now, you, we have had to pay a lot of expense in order to, yeah. to do it, but we're just yeah. we're just doing it for the love. Um, there's a, there's a, a topic I really want to talk to you about. And um, it's relevant to chips, um, yeah. food. <laughs> yeah. um, obviously, being a strong man, it takes this is in, this interests me a lot. Not because I'm a fat kid at heart, but just because it's, yeah. it's interesting to me. Food, the food aspect of strong man. Obviously, in order to become strong and to build up a lot of mass, you need to eat a lot. Yeah. And you know, strong men, Alex, you know this as well, are notorious for eating. Yeah. You know, you see insane yeah. feats of eating from strong men. So I was just going to ask you, what is your sort of, so what's your comp diet like when you're in maximum food? So 
building up to a comp about eight to twelve weeks out. I start ramping my calories back up. Mm. Um, coming up to comp day, I'm usually between sort of like eight to ten thousand calories daily. Daily. Shit. Um, <laughs> And, but what I'll do is like so right now I'm on a cut so I eat five thousand a day to drop weight. It's a nice cut. And then my maintenance is usually around seven thousand mark, and I lead that every single day, and then I'll gradually increase them over the twelve week mark. Mm. Might be changing now that I'm going with uh, tighter nutrition. So basically everything's done for me. She tells me what to eat. I literally just cook it and eat it. And is, it is it healthy though? Or is it just calories? Um, the way I do it, I do um, what's called the 80 20 diet. So I try and get 80% of my calories in decent whole food. So, like my breakfast, uh, porridge, eggs, uh, dinner is usually, I have um, literally a bowl of salad, and about my salad is like a thousand calories. So I put eggs in there, I'll put chicken or beef or. I still have all the sauces, just have flavour. Yeah. But so the idea is 80% decent, healthy food, and then 20% whatever the hell I want. Family cheesecake in there? Uh, no, not very often. I don't eat my desserts. Yeah, because people so, obviously think strongmen just smash the food in. I think they must do, though. You must do. The problem with what you see on YouTube is it's novelty. Like, don't worry, people like Eddie Hall, yes, they did. They were 10,000 calories daily. You know, I mean, that's the equivalent of four large Domino's pizzas. Doesn't sound you know? so bad to me. But when you look at it, like the average person, you know, he's taken years upon years to get to that 10,000 calories. So you build up to it. Yeah. I said 5,000 calories for me. I have three meals a day, which are 1,000 calories each. And I got 2,000 calories for snacks. So what I tend to do is my three meals. You have 2,000 calories for snacks. That's some people's like bulk diet. Yeah. So <laughs> what I tend to do is my three meals are decent meals. So like evening meal is always something like spaghetti bolognese, a curry, Ooh. you know, something like that. Decent meal. Um, and I do all my own cooking as well, so everything's cooked from scratch. So I know exactly what goes in my food. And then, if I want something, then my snacks. Then basically, I got two thousand calories to eat what I want. If I want to go out and have a bit peckish, I'll have a Big Mac. Or, a bit peckish. Or, or, <laughs> I can have whatever I want. That's my sort of treat myself. Yeah. Um, I would most days I come in. I'm like, I look at my because uh, I sort of track everything through my fitness my pal. Fitness pal, yeah. I could be 2,000 calories shy. If I phys- if like certain meal is massive and I physically can't eat anymore, I will go into the next day. But what I tend to do, I don't believe in calories per day. I like calories per week. So I'm allowed 35,000 calories a week. So if I know, all right, me and the missus are going to go out for a meal on Sunday, I know damn well I'm going to eat... 25,000? Yeah, I'll eat 5,000 calories in one meal because I'll have a starter, a main dessert. I have full-fat cocoa. So... If I don't eat 2,000 calories on a Monday, it's fine because I'm going to eat it on Sunday. So as long as my weekly calories total up, you still get, well, I'll have the desired weight loss I want. And then on top of that, as long as I eat a certain amount of protein a day, I'm fine. I don't care about fats and carbs. I, all I tend to do, it's like I said, obviously I'm coaching, I tell my clients the same thing. Everyone's body's different. Depending on how you've eaten from a child, mm. if you've lived off chips, rice, pasta, your body's going to work better with carbs. Yeah, I've always been more towards meats, so I love bacon, you know, steak. So my body reacts better with fat. So I have quite a high level of carbs still, but I would rather a high. How many? Fat how many carbs? Is like a, quite a high level. I think I have four hundred grams a day. I thought I thought it'd be more. I thought it'd be like nine thousand or something. Yeah, nine thousand. Uh, <laughs> I think. It's, so what's your fat like then? That must be it. fat at the moment. I think is around three hundred and fifty. <laughs> oh, that sounds my, a lot. That sounds disgusting. Fat, I think my fat and carbs are almost level. Yeah, that's so, strange. Because my carbs are three hundred plus. Yeah, and my fat is sub one hundred always. Yeah, no, I, I react better. It's, it's not crap fat. So, so it's like I said, I have a lot of coconut oil, animal fats, olive oil. You have to like sink a whole thing of olive oil for yeah. that. Um, <laughs> like nuts, I eat a lot of nuts. Yeah. So it's not just a case of you know, like we have real butter. So it's it's not like you know, flora light. Yeah, I try to stay away from like hydrogenated fats. So I try not to eat those if I can help it. Um, so as I said, it's good, healthy fats. So I said, a big thing when it comes to weight loss is I said, if you don't eat fat, your body won't allow you to lose it either. Same with water. I said, if you don't drink water, you'll actually retain more water. Mm. So it's, I tend to find by having a higher fat diet, one, I perform better because mm. it does digest a bit quicker and I, I find I have an energy boost quicker. Like I said, carbs are still quite high. But that suits me. Yeah. Like I have other clients that, like I said, same as you, their, their fat intake is extremely low. But that's what they've been like for years. So there's no point in me going right up your fat intake and do this. Like I'm not a nutritionist. I give them advice. So 
But I said, I can work calories out for everyone. I can work their protein out. But I said, when it comes to carbs and fats, that's a personal preference. Yeah. Like, you could literally eat... If your body needs 2,000 calories, I could literally ask you to eat 1,800 calories of fat a day. Nothing else. You'll still drop weight. And you'll lose body fat as well. Mm. What it's, it's a, Your body will burn that 1,800 calories because it needs 2,000 to maintain your muscle mass. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what you eat. It's when you get into the surplus calories... That's when it sort of matters a bit more. You eat a lot of fat, you'll store it straight away. Carbs, you might be able to get away with, but yeah, again, it's personal preference. Yeah, it still amazes me the fact that you eat seven to ten thousand calories daily. Yeah, like you know, like the thought of waking up and having to eat that. Like you know, we all joke around, you know, about like you know, oh, we could eat this, we could eat that, you know, we could yeah. eat crap. But do you know when it's actually in front of you? Yeah, right. You need to eat seven k calories yeah. today. It must be like such a daunting mental task. Truthfully, when I first started Strongman, I thought it'd be amazing. Like right now, with my weight loss calories, 5,000 for me is doable, as long as I actually remember to eat. Because if I say, if I have a lazy day and I'm on my Xbox, I might not eat. Are you hungry at 5K? No. God, no. No? Sometimes I struggle to eat 5K. Um, when it starts getting to high levels and I'm pushing eight, 9,000, I hate food with a passion. My first two meals, amazing. By the time I've got through them... Oh, I can't. I don't want any. So, what are those meals like then? So, say now you've got 8k calories to eat. What, how, how on earth do you achieve that? What I tend Ask, to do I'm is I found uh, <laughs> tips. So, I'll make up a 2000 calorie two litre shake. So, it'll be like five scoops of protein. I'll put peanut butter in, Ooh. bananas, all that. And I'll put it in a big jug and I'll drink that throughout the day. So, that's automatically, for some reason, I can drink like a fish. So, that's 2,000 calories without even thinking. Yeah. Um, if I'm really struggling, my other after is survival flapjacks. And it's literally, it comes out, it's... Survival a, flapjacks? What, yeah, what so are they? extremely high-calorie flapjacks. I'd love to try one of them. Um, extremely you sweet. You fat bitch. <laughs> yeah, so basically, I think when she made it, it came out to be about the size of an A5 piece of paper. Uh, and it was okay. about literally an inch thick. The whole thing was 20,000 calories. <laughs> what? Sign me up. I'm yeah. there. How? So, A5... What that noise? It's literally like I think it's survival. Was it like just Oops. pure fat then? No sugar. sugar. All sugar. There's barely any fat in it. You got obviously your butters and then oats, cornflakes goes in it. Nuts go on it. She covers it in chocolate sauce. Um, an entire bottle of golden syrup goes into it. Are you taking orders by any chance? Oh, she she, she loves it. But we cover it in seeds and everything. So I think the original recipe was meant to be fifteen thousand. But because we put seeds, chocolate, nuts, and everything on top of it, mm. we've managed to bump it up. But So I cut it into little 2,000-calorie slithers. Mm. And it's literally a cube like that. It's tiny. But I admit that you're going to have one out of a sugar rush. But So I would have one Yeah, of those. you couldn't eat one of them a day. Like, you know, you'd be... I tend... What I was I doing, I would eat it sort of like yeah. half hour into my sessions. Because my sessions can last anywhere up to three, four hours. Yeah. So I find I have a hell of a sugar rush for like two or three hours and then... By the time I finished training, it sort of died off. But yeah, they are uh, sweet as well. If you haven't got sweet, if you can't handle sweet, don't even bother. Oh, I don't mind it's, a bit of sweet. But yeah, I think an entire bottle of golden syrup, I think that's on top of having sugar in it. Uh, I think she puts honey in it. There's so it's a diabetic's worst nightmare. Basic, oh, God, yeah. You know, if you ate the whole thing, you'd probably be diabetic in a day. It's, it's insane. But like I said it was designed for like hikers that are going out. You know, you literally zip lock bag it. It's there for an emergency. Um, things like that. Like if I get through the day and I'm like, all right, I've got, I'm on 6,000 calories, and it's like, so my cutoff is 7 o'clock. If I get to 5 o'clock, it's like, I've got two hours to eat 2,000 calories. There is no other option. It's a pizza. Or it'd be a Chinese. It'd be something that's Not very thing. easy. It does. It sounds good when you say that. Like, oh, God, I've got to get 2,000 calories. And, oh, God, oh, yeah, order a Chinese. And... But the thing is, though, like yeah. said, if you oh, imagine... Shit. So if you imagine go to an all-you-can-eat and you've literally eaten everything you can physically eat... And an hour later, I'm telling you right now, you've got to eat an entire large Domino's pizza. Yeah, I suppose it's fun when it's, we're when we're when eating. you're hungry. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. But like I said when you are absolutely stuffed, and it's force feeding basically. Yeah. Um. So that's why I said that's why I started the fasting. I, I can force feed for twelve hours, but if I was to stretch that out for say the eighteen hours, because I try to sleep between four to six hours a day. If I stretch that out, I'm in agony all day. My stomach bloats. Um, like I said, my belt, I have to adjust my belt every single time I go to the gym then because I said if I train in the morning, I'm not so big. So I find by doing it for 12 hours, then fast for that 12, I do digest a lot better. Yeah. But yeah, it's literally, like I said, I might enjoy my first two, maybe three meals. 
And then after that, I'm literally, I look at food and I'm like, oh, yeah. that's the hardest part. I would rather train another 20 hours a week than eat what I have to eat sometimes. Yeah, I suppose, but, I mean, I've never really been in that position. I've never actually been like particularly lean. I've always had a bit of fat to me. Yeah. But I'm I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm hardly big. I'm on three thousand calories now, clean, super yeah. super clean. Not a you know nothing out of out of check. Yeah. You know, and it just feels it feels better. And the thought, I think that's why we're like, oh, that sounds amazing. Because when you do eat clean, you know, cream of rice yeah. and protein powder, and you're eating you know potatoes, you're not going too heavy on the fats. Yeah. And when you say you can have a Domino's pizza tonight, I'm like, yes. But when you're doing that, and you're having the equivalent of like four or five of them a day. You're like, you know yeah. what? I've had enough for this now. I don't. Well, want like it. we make. I, I don't. It's Super like omelets. One of the biggest things I like, I'll have like a six egg omelet for breakfast. I, I'll put a whole pepper, onion. I'll put bacon in there, a load of cheese. I, I mean, this thing is an inch thick. It's the size of a large frying pan. You know, it's overlapping my plate. And you put in the calories, it's eight hundred calories. It's like there's there's next to nothing in it. Yeah, it's, it's all I, good food. But so. I'm full then. Yeah. So like two hours later, then I'm like, right, okay, I need to eat again. Um, so that'd be like one of my snacks. And again, so that'll have to be something, again, six, seven hundred calories as a snack. Mm. So, like, we've gone on to, have you seen the, the protein sachets you can get in Aldi's and that now? Yeah, 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 I've seen them. If you have a sweet tooth, try the mousses, the chocolate mousses. Oh, oh they're the dessert ones? Yeah. Yeah, I have them, they're nice. Are they oh, protein mousse? Protein yeah, mousse from Aldi. So, that so sounds like a cheat code. Not, oh, it is. Oh, my, if you have a sweet tooth, I have one of those in the evening. They're only 154 calories. calories. 20 grams of protein. I don't want chocolate. I don't want sweets. I'm happy. So they're sold out. Them, they're sold out all the time, though, aren't they? Go to the one by Tesco's. Full. Oh, the one up in Trostra. Yeah, the new one. Full. Well, don't say that. We should. Need, we need to edit that out, actually, because <laughs> if that goes on air, I feel like uh, I'm never going to have a chance um, to see them again. Yeah, yeah well, so, we know. We'll just edit that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'll have like two of those, and I'll have like two sandwiches, two packets of crisps, and that's a snack. You know, what people have as a meal, I'm having the snacks. That sounds like a lunch to people. Yeah, so, and then after that, like I said, I tend to buy the trays of salad. I'll have the whole tray, and I will literally put things on top of it. So, like I said, big thing is prawn mayonnaise, because the, the sauce for mayonnaise is stupidly high in calories. Mm. Um, yeah, mayonnaise, 10 grams of fat for one small yeah. table tablespoon. Yeah. So like, which is what, like um, nearly 100 calories per tablespoon of mayonnaise. If you have a look at the seafood sauce, it's even worse. Yeah? Yeah, oh God, yeah. But so I actually took a picture. I've got a. I was going to post it up on social media to show you. Obviously, not all salads are healthy because obviously, you see the salad. It's literally a small box like that. Uh, I can't remember exactly. What it was, like a couple of eggs in there, like pickles. Dress in yeah. there, I imagine. And the th- I worked it out. It's a thousand calorie salad. You're better off just having a Big Mac. Yeah, but it's again. It's depending on how I get. So I, I think almost every evening so far, I get to the end of the day, I'm like, damn, I've still got like 1,500 calories or 1,000 calories. I've still got to eat, and that's only on 5,000. So, like I said, when it gets to the higher calories, you've got to find tricks. Like I said, the protein shakes, things like that. You know, I eat a lot of meat. Like, I switch, when I go, especially when I go to higher calories, I very rarely eat chicken. Mm. It's always beef, pork, high fat meats that yeah. have got a lot more calories in them. They're also a lot more nutrient dense as well, so they're actually better for you than chicken. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's it's a case of force feeding. That must not be nice. No. Like I said, first <laughs> couple of meals they go down. Eat. That was a passion. There are though. some days, like I said, if you have like a really heavy deadlift day and like you've trained that day's worth of eating, like you are hungry, you could no problem. But I said, do you really need that though? Do you really need all those extra calories? I it's mean, more to do. Believe it or not, is it just like, the weight you need to maintain? It's more to keep your energy stores up. So you basically want to keep your energy up. Like you'd be surprised how many calories you burn during a weight session. I can imagine. Yeah. So like, the average weight. bodybuilder goes in does what forty five minutes, six, an hour. You know they might burn say seven eight hundred calories, so they can keep their calories low. But you go in and do powerlifting session, strongman session, especially with events. My session could be three, four hours. Yeah. And I yeah. am lifting for three or four hours. I know. I, I don't see myself doing a... Like today, no. It wasn't even an SBD. It was yeah. squats, a bit of bench, and then some accessories. You know, two hours. Yeah. And, you know, I did, you know, multiple reps of heavy weight. You know, yeah. it's very... It gasses you out, you know. Yeah, there's a so lot it's, of... It's very... Dem- like, I was known when I was in DW, I don't know if you ever saw, like, I'd say I was doing a deadlift session. I would stop halfway through, and I've got, like, chili and rice. And I've eaten chili and rice halfway through my session on the gym floor. You know, so <laughs> I don't remember class. seeing and that. And that was just because I, w- I didn't want to go four hours without eating because obviously the negative. Because you knew then you're going to have to, yeah, yeah. So again, the calorie intake you need, and obviously 
everyone just assumes we're a strong man. That's the same with powerlifting. It's just that one weight session, but it's not. Obviously, you've then got your day-to-day life. You have to have your calories for that. Like my maintenance calories, if I don't get off the sofa, is 3,500. So that, I've got to be 3,500 just to stay as I am now, assuming I don't get off my Xbox. Yeah. Right? So now, obviously, with a four-hour weight session, plus I'm now doing the endurance training on top of that, that's anywhere from half hour to 45 minutes of cardio on top playing with the kids on top then they said starting working Tesco now like last night 17,000 steps in 9 hours that's the thing I've noticed you know, that so retail, you know you do 20 plus now with my cut I might have to add another 1,000 calories just to compensate for working in Tesco's so you do actually need the calories um, you don't need to be living on 10,000 calories a day that I tend to push like very very rare cases. yeah like if you have a massive show like UK is a big one 3 day event I will build up to 10,000 calories ready for about two weeks out. So I'll start on my 6,000 and I'll literally, every sort of three weeks, I'll add another 1,000 calories. So I'm slowly building up. I won't do 10,000 a day for 12 weeks. It'll kill me. Yeah. But, and again, it's literally just, same as with the weight trip, you're peaking for the show. As soon as the show's done then, I don't just drop to 6,000. I then come back down as a pyramid. Mm. So you so it's being smart when you do it. So obviously... Say I want to sit at 140 kilos in body weight, but when I get to a show, I might weigh that 146 because the calories have gone up. I'm in a surplus still, mm. but energy levels through the roof. Oh, I can imagine. So, again, some people do, some people don't. Like you know, like we was talking about Gavin Bilton. He's more muscle mass than me. He's taller than me. he needs more calories than me. Yeah, he looks you know, like he eats like 12,000. Brian Shaw. I mean, some of his calories. He went down. To his cut doesn't he? Diet. Yeah, he eats about 9,000 like, all year round. Yeah, uh, he, if he's losing weight, he'll eat nine thousand calories. His average diet was between twelve to fourteen thousand a day for maintenance, or for while well, he's training. Yeah, wow. So yeah, but he's six foot nine. Yeah, so it all depends on your body. <laughs> like I, a lot of the calorie calculations I was doing, I was just using the general calculators, um, and then obviously I've done a bit of research. Obviously, a weightlifter doesn't work. At, a calorie calculator doesn't work for a weightlifter. Mm. So it's, I think it worked out as. Per pound of weight, it's something between, I think it was 23 and 28 calories a day per, per pound, pound of weight. So, like, my maintenance calories is between... So, the lower end was 6,000, the higher end was 8,000. That's my maintenance. Just to stay as you are? Yeah. So, um, what's that now? 23 calories per pound of body per weight. Per you should be eating. Weight. Like I said, then that's what they reckon. I think it was that. I that's a lot for me, though. That's nearly 5,000 for me. Yeah. I would probably say at your weight now for... Because I'm what? To build up to a show, yeah. 3,000, I would probably say way too low. Yeah, I am cut in, actually. I'd put you on 3,000 personally as a trainer for bodybuilding. Yeah. So... I know I, I have, I've always thought my calories are a bit low because my, my carbs are 300 and I'm, yeah, I'm training 12 hours a week of pretty heavy yeah. intense training. So it's... Again, everybody's different. Like I said, I sign up with this nutritionist now. She might change everything. You know, she might go, well, no, no, you're going to put drop me to 3,000 for, say, six weeks, get the rapid weight loss, and then bump me up. Could be a bikini diet, you never yeah, know. Yeah, you know, so, <laughs> but, so my aim now is obviously I've gotten to where I thought would be my peak. Now I've still got three years left in the sport, so now I'm doing... So I've coached myself. I've never had a coach properly before, done all my own training. Now it's a case of I don't want to think anymore. So, you just want to do. Yeah, so basically, like I said, teaming up with Big Laws now in January so basically literally look at my phone right that's what I'm going to do exactly the same with my food um, I have the advantage my other half is a sports massage therapist so my recovery is sorted I have three sessions a week with her sorry did I? Uh, it saves me a fortune that <laughs> yeah um, like I said we're doing longevity tra- a lot of longevity training so there's a lot of like self meditation there's ice ice therapies sauna therapies yeah um, so putting all that on so now basically I don't have to think of anything it's all on the calendar right Monday, right? Today is deadlift day. Oh, but I wish my coach did that for me. Yeah. <laughs> Eat this at this time so, and then go and do this yeah. recovery. And then so she does all recovery work. She's planned out. So Lars will go right Monday. You're deadlifting, and then I go to my nutritionist. Goes right. This is what you're eating. My other half goes right. Today you've got hot therapy in the sauna, and then Tuesday is massage. Wednesday yeah. could be ice therapy. I love. She does. I do nothing. I just cook my food. Yeah, yeah. I, I love. I love the. Re- yeah. I love the recovery stuff that strong men do. You know. Yeah. You, you see. I remember I watched, you know, Hafthor was very public about his hot and cold. He would do that a lot. Yeah. I do that a lot. So now it's a cold shower. And it feels, it feels good. I don't know what, what the effects are, is, though. Yeah, so basically it's more to do with the long-term effects. But, like, ice baths, if you think about it, like, when you train, you're, you're ripping muscle mass. So inflammation. 
all the ice bath brings the inflammation down. You just heal a little bit quicker. Yeah. Hot therapies, again, there's other things. It flushes the blood through. It's So they have their reasons. But uh, the hot, cold treatments, they reckon are good because it does like the vasodilation. So you go to hot, so your blood vessels are yeah, yeah, open up. Yeah, vast yeah. restriction. Yeah. You know, so I said it's back and forth. Um, so I tend to keep them separate. So like, I'll have a 30-minute infrared sauna, and then I'll do my ice therapy maybe later on. But right. like every shower I have now, um, I've been I've done if you've seen the program Limitless with Chris Hemsworth. I um, think if you yeah. Yeah, so it's um on National Geo or Disney Disney Channel if you have the app for that. I, I always I would recommend watching that. We're only like four episodes in, but it's covered sort of memory, strength, everything. Oh but yeah, because he's been diagnosed with like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's he's something. ten times more likely to have Alzheimer's than the average person. So he's looked at longevity for his life. And yeah. they've gone into hot cold therapies, fasting, things like that. Um, like stupid things. Obviously, he can do 30, 40 pull ups in one go. They asked him to climb a rope. He managed like three meters and couldn't climb anymore mm. because it's a completely different way of training. So like, it goes on about strength as not just being able to lift a barbell, but can you climb a rope? Can you climb a tree? It's relative. Up? To yeah, it's, else. it's different. So, But we've been looking into sort of the same sort of stuff. And I, I think we've got two episodes left to watch and we've incorporated a lot of that sort of stuff into my lifestyle now. Yeah. Especially, I said, with my medical condition. So just to help with everything. But yeah, they go into ice treatments, hot treatments. Um, I said, he does, he doesn't fast as much as I do. He does like three days a week where he won't eat until after 12 o'clock. He'll do an entire 24 hours once a month. Um, And he's planning on once a year doing a four day fast. Four, four day fast, yeah. Yeah, so that's what he does on the episode. It's a four day fast he does. He hates it, but he feels the effects after. And it's to do with basically clean out what's called zombie cells in your body. Yeah, like really, yeah. yeah. It flushes all that out. So, like, we've been sitting down talking about it and we've incorporated it in. So, like I said, I do 12 hour fast every day. One day a month, I will do a full day fast. And I don't know if I could go four days without food, so we might do a two-day fast. But that'll strip so, off muscle as well. Like, that's probably not useful for your sport. Depends. Your body is very good at maintaining stuff. So I said, still drink water and everything. In four days, you're not really going to lose much. If you no. were to do this long-term, yes. So, like, during those four days, I'll still train. I'll still do everything. But, like I said, it's not really long enough for me to lose... Like, you might lose... Fraction, you're talking like 0.01%. The thing is, is that your, your body doesn't look to protein for an energy source immediately no, it's when it's straight, struggling. Obviously, you look at me, my body's going to go straight to my fat cells. Mm. Like, my biggest problem, I retired from Strongman at the end of 2019 and stupidly carried on eating like a strongman yeah. while not training because of lockdown. So that's where most of my size came from. I just managed to sort of drop the fat now. So by doing the fasting now, my body, like I said, once it's burnt the food I've eaten, it goes straight for the fat cells. Yeah. Admittedly, it would only do that for a certain period of time. But like I said, the muscle mass should be okay. Like I said, we haven't quite discussed whether I'm going to do the four-day fast. I, I I get very upset if I don't have food. I think we I all do. hungry. So, but yeah, so we're trying to incorporate things like that just to sort of aid my recovery. Mm. Um, like a big thing, obviously, every, you say some people do strongman, instant reaction is, oh, so what steroids do you take? I I choose not to take them. So like, I've got to do go above and beyond recovery-wise in order to try and keep up. Yeah. So, like I said, that's why look, I said, I'm lucky enough. I said, my other after is my massage. I'm sponsored by the Lazy Frog, so I do my infrared treatments with them. So, like I said, it's just things like that, basically. Trying to push everything recovery-wise and, like I said, diet-wise in order to just aid my strong man. Yeah, it's all well and good lifting the heavy weights, but you also need to do the other th- the other two things, new yeah. recovery, nutrition. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not... It's like I said, I look at it as a triangle. You say you've got to have the nutrition, you've got to have your recovery. Like I said, one thing most people do is mobility. I, I'm, I'm a stickler. I've trained strongman five years. Um, I started doing um, what's called ROMWOD. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's basically a mixture of, like, yoga and pilates but it was designed for crossfitters but we use it for strongman as well i've done it for like three months my mobility increased oh exponentially stopped doing it then and now i said oh my mobility is shocking like, yeah touching my toes ain't gonna happen like so now we're incorporating that back into it so it's, it's again it's there's actually more to do on the nutrition and recovery side than there is on the training side mm. like i said everyone thinks oh it's just i'll be in the gym i'll be the strongest man in the world no you won't 
I said, you go into the gym and only train, eat crap, and don't do any of the recovery side, you'll probably injure yourself yeah. in the first three and years. And this is important as well, because people who train in a bodybuilding fashion, they don't really feel it as much because they train some things usually once a week. Yeah. But for me, no, if I'm squatting three days a week, look, today I squatted heavy, tomorrow I'm deadlifting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then we're going again then. On Tuesday, we're squatted again. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've got to recover, otherwise you're going to... I, I tighten up a lot as well. Yeah, so like I said, that's where like the mobility side... So like with Romwald, it's a 20-minute routine once a day. Mm. That's literally it. Um, but it's like you hold the stretches for long periods of time, anywhere from like a minute to four minutes. So the muscle remembers the stretch. So it, I found it increased my mobility stupid amounts. Mm. But yeah, like I said, a lot of people go in, like bodybuilders, they'll go in, they do oh, it's chest and triceps today, I'm not going to touch that for another week. Yeah. Powerlifters tend to like squat, bench, and deadlift maybe two, three times a week, sometimes four. Um, strong men tend to have more of a split. So most of them are like deadlift one day, squat one day. Because I mix in powerlifting and deadlift, and I do all three lifts twice a week, or four lifts, sorry, twice a week. So when I deadlift, I'll do a secondary squat won't be heavy it'll be higher rep stuff but it's a squat that will aid my deadlift yeah so it's front squat zercher squats um leg press same on squat day i'll do a deadlift that will aid my squat Mm. so like i said sumo deadlifts things like that things that work different muscles sumo's cheating though so Ah, (laughs) that's as a main lift that's as one rep max but i said that's that's one thing i don't agree with power lift i don't agree with sumo and conventional in the same competition really no, I don't agree. It's a completely different lift. It is, well, like it's different leverages, I think. If you can, well, yeah, but it's just. I if mean, you're mobile enough to get your toes just either side of the plates, I've done. I've proven it. I've done a conventional deadlift. I think the bar come up. I think it was something like, say, twenty four inches, whatever it was. Yeah. Then a sumo, it come up like sixteen. It's a shorter movement. It incorporates different muscles. It's exactly the same as me going right. Okay, you've got bench press. Oh, so I'm not very good at bench press. I'm gonna do incline bench press. Hmm. It's exactly the same thing. It's a completely different lift. Do you reckon? That's an interesting thought there. I've I know. never thought of it like that before. So, but, I mean, I understand because they've changed the rules in, in powerlifting now because there were people benching and oh. they would bench. Like, you've actually got to hit depth on bench now. Yeah, yeah. it's an inch range of motion. Because they were... Yeah. You, I mean, I've, you've, I've, I've, both of you have seen it, you know, with the... <laughs> the yeah, that little girl, with the girl, then it was, it was like, yeah, she was I had to watch it like three times because I didn't see the bar move. Yeah, yeah. No, it's basically... Yeah, I think at the moment, it's only in the IPF at the moment, I think it is. But yeah, you've got to bring... Elbows have got to break 90 degrees or something. Yeah, they have, yeah. So, and I think they obviously they are looking at bringing that. Like, it's I not a problem compete. for me anyway. I can't get I can't get into that position no. anyway. <laughs> like, I compete with the BPU at the moment. Like I said they're looking at bringing those in as well, mm. but yeah, I think conventional and sumo are compl- two completely different lifts. Mm. So, but uh, I'm not going to argue with the powerlifters. I'll leave them to it. <laughs> yeah, you'll, just, you'll just take the piss out of them. Yeah, and I'll, just, I'll just I'll just compete, take their records, and leave. That's, that's fine. <laughs> so it's been it's been really good to talk to you today, Matt. And I've, I got I got to be honest, I really enjoyed this podcast. Um, Alex, I hope you enjoyed as well. I have enjoyed, even though that I need to change to conventional now because I can't pull sumo. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been good to talk to you, Matt. Is there anything you want to say to anyone? Shout anyone out? Um, Stop beef with anyone? Yeah. Oh no, I kind of keep that quiet. That one. Uh, yeah, just basically a big shout out. I said everyone that sort of helps. Me, I said my biggest sponsor, Cerberus Strength. My biggest one. We've got the Lazy Frog. I said stupid things. Hub Six. Oh sorry, Six Hub. Like I said, Didn't just again. Out, yeah. yeah, you know. Um, I said, obviously, my partner, Juggernaut uh, Recovery. Mm. Like I said, doing all my recovery work. It's just people, I said, the te- my, what I class is my team. So, but yeah, I said, it's been brilliant on the show. And uh, thank you for having me. It's all right, yeah. mate. It's a I've, pleasure. I've, um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this and I've learned, I've learned a lot. Um, oh, we two... need to get a strongman session in. So if you oh, want to see yeah, that, yeah. comment below and uh, we'll get that sorted after my competition. <laughs> well, I need to, I might have to put that forward a bit, put that back a bit because now I need to learn conventional because I don't want to cheat. Yeah. Matt's going to be there watching. <laughs> yeah, he's he's going to be there like, oh yeah, I see you. But it's been brilliant to have you on, Matt. Um, like I said, it's, I've, I've enjoyed this and I've learned, I've learned a lot and it's, it's good to chat to different people. You're the first yeah, ever, yeah. It's the first, first strongman ever strongman we've had on. I've it's, interviewed it's a strongman before, a strong woman before. Her name is Catherine Bennett. She's uh, American, 2020 Utah, Utah's strongest woman. Utah. <laughs> um, yeah. And she lives like literally like around the corner from Brian Shaw, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I interviewed her before. That was interesting, but uh, we've never had. Uh, I've never actually met a strong man. I don't yeah. think yeah, in yeah. the flesh. It's um, quite surprising. Yeah, I said 
there's quite a few, which is obviously they tend to be in like niche gyms. You don't see them in the general gym. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as I said, like now the sport's starting to pick up a bit. We're getting a lot more people interested in it. So yeah, hopefully we'll start picking up a bit more. Yeah, we we'll link uh, all your um, all your links down below in the ah, description. Cheers. So if you want to check out Matt, if you want to follow his journey, um, see him compete. Um, seem to take the piss out of powerlifters <laughs> then you'll find his Instagram below and obviously all the relevant links to his coaching if you want to get involved with him you'll see the link to the Cerberus uh, website Juggernaut Recovery but always guys like always thank you for listening and have a nice day I say we like I was there, but uh, oh, these ones are actually quite comfortable. Oh, I yeah, see those are brand new. Five yeah. minutes sat down, my joints just clicked. Oh, oh yeah, everything's up now. <laughs> Get some blood back.